makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lackle here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Traders prepare for a U.S. payroll print forecast to show hiring slowed last month. The Fed's Mary Daly says rates can hold steady if the labor market continues to cool. We're live from Granada, Spain, where EU leaders will be laying the ground for the bloc's strategic agenda. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky urges them to stay united in the face of Russian aggression. Plus, Bloomberg has learned that Exxon is in talks to acquire shale-focused Pioneer Natural Resources. It's potentially one of the biggest deals this year. Now, first of all, happy Friday, everyone, because I know it's been certainly a roller coaster of a market, a roller coaster of a week, especially if you've been trading in fixed income. Let's take this Friday morning a look at the European markets map, a little bit more of stability. Uh, but we have a number of stories on the Bloomberg terminal that are, of course, great reads, for example, looking at the 5 percent bond market and what that means in terms of pain heading everyone's way. In terms of what we're seeing across the board, so we're seeing slight gains, nothing huge, nothing to write home about. But we are seeing a little bit of gains across the board. European stocks edging higher, but it's all to do with the U.S. jobs data. Hoping, of course, we'll have a bit more news of whether there's more pressure to come from the Federal Reserve or whether that eases a touch. Now, miners amongst the best performers in uh, the stock 600. Uh, there's news that China's iron ore buying agencies and talks with some of the global suppliers. Look out for VIX after, after the week that we've had. And, of course, the big one is a 10-year. This is what happened to the 10-year yield over the last 20 days. Now, just over an hour into the European session this Friday, let's also take a look at some of the movers with Joe Easton from our equities team. So, Joe, happy Friday. You're talking bowels and you're talking insurance. <laughs> Yeah, we've got an eclectic mix for you today, Fran. But we've got some decent moves this morning, starting off in Amsterdam. Philips getting absolutely slammed. That's the biggest decline in around a year. The US FDA announced last night that they're expanding their inspections of Philips sleep apnea device. Now, as a reminder, this is a product that people would attach to their mouths while they slept and it emitted a certain foam and there was concern that that could potentially have negative health impacts and there was a big recall. The FDA saying that they will now expand testing following further investigations. That's ticking even lower now down the most since November last year for the medical tech company. Then we're going to flip over, look at something completely different. We're going to look at insurance because Aviva in the UK, one of the best performers in London at the moment. Now, this seems to be stemming from a blog post on a website called Betaville a few days ago, which reported potential takeover interest. Now, the Times has followed up on that. The Times of London reported something similar. It's all very vague, but that stock now trading at a five-month high. It's the UK's biggest general insurance company. So they do life insurance, car insurance, pretty much everything. Takeover interest circling among traders, unconfirmed at the moment. And we've reached out to Aviva for a comment, so we'll wait to hear back from them. Then finally, the staple goods sector. Now, you mentioned you referred to the Wagovi, the stomach drug, earlier just now in the build-up. I'm not going to talk about bowel movements, thankfully, but the staple goods are declining because Walmart said after the close yesterday or late trading yesterday that they're seeing a decline in some sales of some goods. And they're saying that might be due to the Wagovi appetite suppressant drug from Novo Nordics. And that's feeding through, according to traders that we've been speaking to, that's what's weighing on Unilever and Nestle and a bunch of other staple goods, the companies that supply supermarkets with all these staple food products. Now, I would note that we're also seeing a decline in AB InBev. I haven't got that one on the screen, but AB InBev is declining, the maker of beer. So that brings into question, is it really Wagovi driving that? Because Wagovi is more related to suppressing food, not alcohol. Potentially questioning that. Maybe it's more of a rates move, but definitely an interesting story. Yeah, a lot go I mean, a lot going on in fixed income, a lot going on in currencies this week. And on a Friday, even a lot going on in some of the stocks. Joe Easton, thank you so much for a terrific roundup. Now, we're, of course, watching U.S. payrolls later today, how that will impact markets, especially treasuries, after the brutal sell-off. For more, we're joined by Naila Richardson, chief economist at ADP, as well as Laura Cooper, senior investment strategist at BlackRock. So thank you both for joining Joining us, Laura, how are we doing? Are we surviving the week? I mean, it was, it was pretty volatile. It was like a bit of a roller coaster. And again, it's 
unclear th what crystallized the fears in the markets. Well, I think certainly the price action around this rates repricing towards this new macro regime of higher inflation has really been the most pronounced move. And I think the question that we've been facing from clients is where is this end point where we're going to start to see buyers coming in? And we really question the fact that you know rates are likely to go even higher above that 5% mark because if we look at the term premium, it's only positive about 30 basis points now based on some models. There is scope for it to go higher even if we see bouts of volatility as some dip buyers return. I mean, the market sometimes is ahead of the curve and sometimes it's really behind. So we have a number of stories saying, look, this is what breaks if we set 5% for, for a longer time, maybe a much longer time. I mean, what happens at 5.5 or 6%? Is there something that you need to sell off or take stock of right now? So clearly the U.S. economy cannot withstand rates at that level, particularly when the moves have been driven by real rates and the fact that we do have that 10-year rate with a 2% handle. We're already seeing that in terms of a slowing in consumer discretionary spending. That's likely going to be the key trend next year. If we think about mortgage rates are sustainably already above 7%, mortgage applications for new homes have fallen to multi-decade lows. So we are going to see the consumer come under pressure in this backdrop of tighter financial conditions. And that really raises the question of how long can the Fed keep rates in restrictive territory? It's less about another 25 basis points or so. It's when will they actually ease policy next year. Now, this is the million dollar, trillion dollar question. But in the meantime, what happens to credit? What happens to actually households having to repay debt in the U.S.? Well, let's start with the labor market, because what's different about a Fed tightening cycle is that we still have a strong labor market. So there is some support for the consumer in the U.S. Uh, when it comes to the credit market, obviously borrowing costs have gone up. You've seen housing come to a virtual standstill, not because there's not demand out there. There's no inventory. Most homeowners are locked into a 3 percent interest rate or definitely below 6 percent. So it makes no sense right now to financially put your home on the market and trade to something else. That's what's brought the market to a standstill, not the lack of demand. So the consumer, yes, it's slowing, uh, but it hasn't gone to a standstill yet in a way that tips into recession. I think that's an important but, point. Nella, so yet, and, and yet. the yet is extremely important because right. if you look at hiring, so the labor market is strong, but they're not hiring that much, especially in the private quarters. Well, large firms aren't. If you look at the ADP report, which is about 20 percent of the U.S. workers in the private sector, what you see is an interesting dichotomy between small firms and large firms. Large firms hired aggressively last year. They started pulling back, and we saw all those announcements of layoffs late last year, early this year. You're still seeing weakness in large firms, but small firms have been hiring, and that's very interesting yeah. because you would think that smaller firms were more sensitive yeah. to the rate environment we're in now. They're not showing it in their hiring yet because they're still trying to get their head count up and grow their businesses. And that is a good, important signal that's often missed in the markets. These small firms yeah. aren't part of the market, so it's easy to overlook them. Yeah, that's such an interesting point. All right, this is one of my favorite times of the early mornings, and it's the big number. So every day we choose a big number. Thank you, Dan Tillis, for always coming up with an interesting number. Now, this this is the gap between the survey and the whisper estimates for today's U.S. jobs report. And the difference between that is 20,000. So if you're wondering what the whisper is, it's basically the sweepstake that Laura does at the office, right? That's how we calculate the whisper. I mean, how, how much, how important is this job? I know every month it's important. But again, I, I feel like we're, it's, it's, it could be a watershed potentially moment for the markets. So I think we're going to need to see a significant deviation from that consensus, even beyond that 20,000 whisper margin, because ultimately this is, you know, a, a market that is looking for is the bad news going to be good news? And could we start to see more of those rate cuts that were previously priced out start to be priced back in? We will be watching, though, the unemployment rate and labor force indicators beyond just the payrolls print, because I think clearly that that trend of hiring is slowing. The unemployment rate, what we're looking for is the labor force dynamics around are we going to see more workers return to the workforce because it's really been that structural shift where workers have left that have kept wages elevated we're expecting hourly our average hourly earnings to tick higher again today that's a crucial input into this overall environment where inflation is likely going to be higher through next year and over the medium term uh, and, and Nila, so first of all, I do love this because probably every officer around the world is, you know, putting sweepstakes on rugby matches and football. And here we are with 
the non-farm payrolls. But how quickly or what's the, the, the earliest that you think the Fed could cut interest rates? I think we're a ways from a cut. Um, if, if you look so at... not next year? Maybe. Maybe, um, but not in the first three months of next yeah. year, which is what yeah. some in the markets were thinking, that this would be an over and done uh, yeah. a rate hike by now. But if you look at the labor shortages that you're seeing that are structural in nature, it does keep a floor on wage growth. Um, we are seeing wage growth decelerate. I think that's the number to watch rather than the jobs number, which... That 20,000 whisper, <laughs> that's not even close to the revisions we've seen coming out of these numbers before. But if you look at wage growth, it's been a steady decline. That's great, but it's likely to stay inconsistently higher with 2% inflation. And that is the, the, the rub for the Fed. All the numbers are moving in the right direction, but they're not moving fast enough back to that 2% target. Yeah, Laura, how quickly do you think that the Fed can reverse course? I mean, I know it depends on the strength of the economy, it depends on energy prices, but like, do you push it back? So at this point, we are penciling in a Q3 rate cut next year. And I think the crucial thing is that in the near term, markets have priced out the next rate hike if we do yeah. see a strong print come in today. So there is scope for the move that we have seen in yields to extend and even reverse more of this, this bull steepening rather than the, the bear steepening. And I think that's really crucial to watch for around the next recessionary indicator because timing that downturn has really been the most challenge uh, facing strategists and commentators. All right. So thank you both for joining us. Neil Richardson, Chief Economist at ADP, Laura Cooper, Senior Investment Strategist at BlackRock. Both stay with us. Uh, also, Bloomberg has learned that ExxonMobil is in talks to acquire the shell-focused Pioneer Natural Resources. Now, the deal is huge because it's worth some $60 billion, potentially the largest acquisition of the year. It would make Exxon the top producer in the most prolific U.S. oil base. I'm talking shale oil. It would also make one of the largest oil companies in the world even bigger. Now, pre-market trade, Pioneer, you can see a 10% higher, Exxon down 2%. Much more ahead, and this is Bloomberg. The bond market has tightened quite considerably, over about 36 basis points since we met in September. Well, that is equivalent to about a rate hike, right? And so then the need to do tightening additionally is not there. The uh, Fed Bank of San Francisco President Mary Daly there saying policymakers can hold interest rates steady if the labor market and inflation continue to cool or financial conditions remain tight. Now we're back with Neela Richardson, Chief Economist at ADP and Laura Cooper, Senior Investment Strategist at BlackRock. Okay, so the, the Treasuries are all over the place. Laura. Are you, do you buy anything right now? We also had a story yesterday saying you know, issuance in 2024 may be tricky because there's just so much of it. And the issuance next year is one of the key reasons why we're not extending duration in our positioning. And if anything, you know, yes, we saw the term premium, as I mentioned, about 30 basis points for that 10-year tenor. Back in 2021, we saw about three months of that, where it's close to, to, close to that peak, and then we saw this renewed bids and it's a sharp compression. But we don't think that's going to be the dynamic this time around. So instead, we are seeking short-duration exposures in treasuries. But there's more opportunity, we think, if we look, for example, real rates, the fact, you know, we think that's quite an attractive opportunity, given this is an environment where U.S. economic growth is slowing. But it's about looking for opportunities elsewhere. So looking at the European bond space, which has really been caught up in the spillover effects of the Treasury sell-off, we think at these entry levels it's quite attractive because the growth and inflation dynamics are materially different than what we are seeing in the U.S. Yeah, interesting. And we've had some really big moves also in Europe. Now, when you look at you know, six weeks ago, I think it was all about China and concerns about China and the slowdown in China, what that means to the rest of the world. Now we're focusing on the U.S., but globally, what do you worry most about? That inflation, even if we get it back down to a more comfortable number for all of these global central banks, that it's not going back to where we were before the pandemic, 10 years of slumber. That these central banks, no matter where in the world they are, they have to be much more careful about inflation and its effect on growth. And so it's not just a one-year story going forward. This is a multi-year probably through the next decade. If you look at labor shortages in advanced countries, if you look at a, a hopefully growing China and the geopolitical concerns that 
leads to higher inflation or higher oil prices, all of that adds up to a different picture for the global economy structurally than we saw before the pandemic. But, you know, if you look at, I guess, supply chains, but also this was yes. started under the presidency of Donald Trump, right? The fact that a lot of the supply chain changed because he moved away from China. Are we there or is there still quite a lot of deglobalization or, or de-unpacking to do? I think we're seeing a reshuffling of supply chains, okay. trying to produce the resiliency that won't be disrupted by events around the world. World, but that resiliency comes at a cost, and that cost could be higher prices, which, which feeds inflation. So definitely a different type of supply chain policy or strategy for companies going forward. A anything else, Laura, that you like? I don't know whether you're looking at I mean, Yen also gave us a little bit of a, of a scare, certainly a, a, you know, a bit of attention uh, this week. So in the equity space, I mean, we do still like Japanese equities because we are seeing this inflationary regime shift there as well. But we are taking a more selective and granular approach if we look at U.S. and European equities. So we think tech leadership can persist. We've seen three-month earning revisions become, become quite strong. That's an area that is, has those defensive properties, but as well more of that pricing power in this inflationary environment. And in Europe, it's about looking for those industries that, yes, they can be cyclical in nature, but they're not necessarily acting cyclically. So energy, for example, we think is supported by supply demand dynamics. And as well, industrials, given where we are in the decarbonization cycle and, and, the, and the capital expenditures that we do expect going forward from the transition. Thank you both. That was really, really fun uh, joining you, actually, also, even if it was a, a pretty big news week. Laura Cooper from BlackRock and Naila Richardson from ADP. Now, coming up, Bloomberg understands that Exxon is in talks to secure what could be one of the year's biggest deals. So we'll have the details next. And this is Bloomberg. <laughs> More on the story we told you a little bit about earlier. Bloomberg learning that ExxonMobil is in talks to acquire shale focused Pioneer Natural Resources in a deal worth as much as $60 billion. Now, it's potentially the largest acquisition of the year. You can see pre-market, Pioneer gaining 10 percent, Exxon down 2 percent. Now, joining us is Bloomberg's oil and gas reporter, Laura Hurst. Laura, this is huge. Thank you so much for coming in. I mean, this is, this is worth like $60 billion. What's the logic behind a deal like that, and how does it actually fit with the Exxon strategy? Well, Exxon has been on the lookout for deals in the Permian, which is that shale basin in the U.S. And so they, they just haven't had the right timing because of the coronavirus pandemic. But what that allowed it to do is cut costs severely. So now it's got a lot of cash, oil is back up, and it's a good time for them to buy. I mean, we used to talk, I mean, we used to talk, I feel like every couple of months we talk about oil at $100. Is it now more or less likely? Well, there was a lot of talk about that earlier this week when uh, OPEC Plus scaled back choke production. But uh, that sort of had a bit of a, an adverse reaction in that uh, products, gasoline, uh, has, uh, consumption has started to go down. Uh, and there's talk about demand destruction as a result. So it might have not had the intended consequences from OPEC+. Plus. Um, Laura, Shell. So Shell is higher this morning. The company said that you know, earnings from its gas trading rebounded in the third quarter. The new chief executive is not without controversy because he's also just bluntly saying, look, they want to be less green. So how's that playing out with shareholders? Yeah, so it's a mixed bag. Of course, you've got environmentalists and, and more green-minded invest investors who don't really like the change. But then there are a lot of them like Dan Lode, the activist invent investor at Third Point, who's saying... The, the company is doing great, they're focusing on returns, and that's what we really need right now. So what are you focusing a lot of your reporting on? Again, there, there's OPEC+, Plus. there's this mega deal with Exxon and others. Do you think there's going to be more M&A, or is it just a, a retrenching? I guess everything goes back to the fact that we just don't have enough resources for what we want to do. Well, certainly there, there is a lot of opportunity now for the oil majors because they have a lot of cash. They've cut their costs down a lot. Yeah. And as the war in Ukraine has, has shown, there is still a very big need for oil and gas. So there's a lot of talk of, of is this a time to now go back, increase uh, production, increase reserves, 
uh, rather than explore for oil, which takes time and is very costly. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Laura Hurst there, our Bloomberg oil and gas reporter. Now, some of the other news that we're watching, Russia lifting the diesel export ban that has roiled global markets. That's according to a government statement. Now, weeks after imposing the block shipments can provide or can you resume, provided that the fuel is delivered to Russia's ports by pipeline. Moscow did impose the ban after surging domestic fuel costs drove up inflation. Now, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission wants to force Elon Musk to testify as it investigates his purchase of Twitter shares before taking over the social media platform. Now, the Wall Street regulator said Musk failed to appear to testify last month as requested. Before acquiring all of Twitter, Musk first purchased a 9.2 percent stake in March last year and disclosed it the following month. While the SEC's rules require most people who buy more than 5 percent of a public company to disclose it within 10 days. And FTX co-founder Gary Wang has taken the stand at Sam Bankman Fried's trial, saying immediately that he and his former childhood friend and MIT roommate committed to a multi-billion dollar fraud. Now, Wang is cooperating with prosecutors after pleading guilty to fraud. His testimony promises to be among the most powerful in the government case against Bankman Fried, who has pleaded not guilty. Coming up, Perry Warijo, the Indonesian central bank governor, joins us here for an exclusive conversation. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Traders prepare for a U.S. payroll print forecast to show hiring slowed last month, while the Fed's Mary Daly says rates can hold steady if the labor market continues to cool. We're live from Granada, Spain, where EU leaders will be laying the ground for the bloc's strategic agenda. The Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky urges them to stay united in the face of Russian aggression. Plus, Bloomberg has learned that Exxon is in talks to acquire the shale-focused Pioneer Natural Resources. It's potentially one of the biggest deals this year. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Indonesia's foreign reserves have fallen by over $2 billion to a 10-month low. This comes as the central bank intervened to stabilize the rupiah and the government repaid external debt. Well, with us now is the Bank of Indonesia, Governor Hisperi Wadijo. And thank you, uh, Governor, for joining us for a robust conversation on how difficult it is to set monetary policy right now. How yes. quickly can you cut interest rates? Well, uh, we have to hold our policy rates for a while, not because of Indonesian inflation, which is very low. We need to support good because of the global spillover, which is because uncertainty and the Fed fund rate increase and the pressure of very strong dollar. So we, we, we need to wait that. But, Governor, what's a while? Is it the first half, the second half of next year? How difficult is it at this point to try and calibrate what, when the move down could come? Well, uh, in this very difficult, uncertain world, you know, for instance, I have the idea, you know, but of course the data dependent of the global is, uh, you know, is very yeah. important. How the Fed fund, whether mm -hmm. this November will be the last one, whether yield U.S. Treasury will be decelerating and how the dollar will be declining from 106 to 100 and so on. That's, all of them are depend on that. And you said in the past, actually, that you don't need to match Fed rate hikes. And what you're explaining is extremely important, is that yes. you have an idea, yes. but then you have all of these things that could yes. come and, and hurt that idea. What's your biggest concern that, that would make you come off plan, the plan that you have in your head right now? Well, every country in the world must protect their domestic inflation price stability and financial stability against the impact of dollar strength, yield increase, as well as the uncertainty unfolding in the U.S. The best way to do that, okay, policy rate directly to domestic, while for addressing spillover, adjusting the yield of the government bond vis-a-vis -vis U.S. Treasury yield. This is what we are doing, not only interfering in the FX market, but also selling our Bank Indonesia Rupiah certificate. So, so how effective, actually, has that new Rupiah securities, for example, been in attracting inflows? Well, it was uh, working quite nicely until the last uh, 
two week when dollar hundred six, when UK pound depreciating, when yen depreciating, then there is outflow again. But I'm sure when this uncertainty coming down, then investor will be coming back again. But so, Governor, it, it, are you thinking and actually close to doing, for example, FX denominated securities? Would that would that help in stabilizing? Yes. Is it something that you're considering actively? Yes, we we are in the process of developing that mm -hmm. FX Bank Indonesia uh, securities, Rupiah Bank Indonesia securities, but also FX swap, domestic non-delivery forward. So, investor can have different variety of instrument. This actually will attract portfolio inflows. At least do not making the outflow becoming worse. So, Governor, and I know, you know, for the SRBI securities, you're saying yes. that they were working quite well until a couple of weeks ago when yes. you had that bout of volatility. Yes. Do you worry that because they're short in nature, they actually exacerbate the volatility? I do not think so because we are coordinated closely with Minister of Finance. Fiscal is about longer term yield, 10 years, you know, and beyond. Our securities for the short term liquidity, you know, this actually creating liquidity, also building market mechanism in the domestic uh, yield as well as domestic rupiah visa fee dollar. This is actually adding even more efficient market. But your biggest concern is that you're now going to import inflation, weaker rupiah, higher energy prices. Yeah. This, this, this is, is concerning. This is actually our objective of stabilizing exchange rate. Not targeting the exchange rate, but minimizing the volatility of the exchange rate and their impact to the imported inflation. So what we're addressing, for instance, is imported inflation. You know? Because otherwise, if imported inflation high, inflation ri rising, then I have to address with interest rate. This is cutting the global spillover to not, you know, uh, 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 going to the domestic problem. But so given all the uncertainty with the Fed, how much volatility are you still expecting from, from outside currencies, from some of these outside shocks that then spills mm -hmm. over and, and makes it more problemat problematic for Bank of Indonesia? We still have... We have 137 billion US. It's more than enough to intervene. One. Second, we have also incoming uh, inflows from this portfolio inflows. Mm -hmm. Our management of Bank Indonesia Rupiah and FX uh, uh, securities, as well as increasing FX deposit from natural resource. They're already increasing. We expect end of this year will be about eight to nine billion US dollar from natural resource export. Yeah. This is government but, regulation. So, Governor, you, you seem to be suggesting that because you have that firepower, you'll probably have to intervene some more in rupiah. Uh, if, if needed, yes, we will be continue in the market yeah. for stabilizing exit as well as managing our yield differential. Huh of the government visa fee, U.S. Treasury, so that the inflow, portfolio inflow will be there, mm -hmm. stabilizing our exchange rate. So this is the tactic of, you know, in a different, you know, uh, X mm -hmm. on the basket. We do intervention. We do also managing yield mm -hmm. and the target inflow of portfolio, okay. stabilizing the exchange rate. Governor, do you think that your next interest rate move is a cut or a hike? Well, uh, will be if, friends, we have inflation very low. Last month is 2.7. End of the year, 3%. Next year, 2.8%. Then, actually, the natural response, if we only consider domestic, you know, then actually our policy rate need to be lower. But I cannot lower our policy rate because of the global spillover. So we have to be patient. We have to be patient on that on that aspect. But again, in terms of sequencing, so do you need to see a Fed rate cut before you cut? Well, depending on the investor preferences. What I'm seeing in the foreign investor is seeing the uncertainty. Whether the November the last cut and the last increase of the Fed fund rate. 
whether US Treasury will be keep rising or declining, whether dollar will be declining from 106 to 104, 101. If that stabilizing, then foreign investor, okay, time to invest in Indonesia. Time to go to Indonesia because Indonesia is one of the best performer in emerging market. Whereas, you know, if that happening, then rupiah will be strengthening, right? So this is the dynamic yeah. that we are seeing of on the coming month, mm -hmm. friends, and in this uncertain world, we have to be patient. Patience. The patient is very <laughs> important, right? Are, are, are you <laughs> looking again to calibrate or reducing the RRR to, as a possible pivot point? Is that your first point to try and, and change monetary policy? Well, uh, we have the a good practice in the bank, central bank, that we need to forecast two years down the road. Mm -hmm. Inflation, growth, exchange rate, what the likelihood of Fed fund rate, U.S. Treasury, and so on. We calibrate that month by month, and then, of course, we will announce every board meeting. But from now on, we will to focus on stabilizing our exchange rate and holding our policy rate. Our inflation will be very low, coming down. Our economic growth will be much better. Indonesia continue the best economic performance. Um, Governor, a final question. How, how much volatility are you expecting from election season? And what can the central bank do to, to prepare for that? For? Elections. Well, Indonesia is a big country, a very democratic country. We have been going into a number of peaceful you know, election. I'm not expecting that the election will adding volatility in our uh, macroeconomic and financial stability. Okay, Governor, thank you so much. It was a really thank great you. pleasure My to pleasure host pleasure. you here in the studio. That was Perry Boyo, the Bank of Indonesia Governor. Now, coming up, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is looking for concrete pledges from his European allies, while U.S. officials are trying hard to reassure their allies that the money is coming. We'll go live to Grenada for more on the EU summit next. And this is Bloomberg. Leaders gather for a second day in Granada, Spain, after the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky urges them to stay united in the face of Russian aggression. Meanwhile, the U.S. ambassador to NATO, Julian Smith, sought to reassure European allies, telling Bloomberg, quote, the U.S. is not going anywhere. I think American leadership is here to stay. We've seen the United States take the important leadership role ever since Russia went into Ukraine. We obviously have a temporary situation right now with this continuing resolution that does not include increased support for Ukraine. But based on broad support across Congress for U.S. support for Ukraine, based on what President Biden said when he got on the phone with our allies and with President Zelensky in recent days, and based Based on what you see in terms of polling across the United States, we anticipate that American support for Ukraine will continue. Americans fundamentally understand what's at stake. Now, for more on all of this, let's get straight to our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Maria, good morning. A diplomatic effort from the Ukrainian president. What did he actually achieve? Uh, yes, Francine, and as you played there, uh, when we spoke to the NATO ambassador uh, to the U.S., she uh, asked and answered those questions about Zelensky, some of his concerns, and not just Ukraine, but really the European Union, about whether or not the Biden doctrine is changing. And she said this is just a temporary situation. But nonetheless, uh, this really permeated debate yesterday uh, here in Spain. And to answer your question, uh, President Zelensky was here. It was, uh, so to speak, a diplomatic uh, offensive. He was here for less than 24 hours, I should say. As far as we know, he traveled to Poland. And now he is back uh, in Ukraine. And he carried almost a twofold uh, message. One is that both the U.S. and Europe uh, made a promise to help Ukraine. And this is a moment uh, of unity. Francine, just to let you in on an anecdote uh, from yesterday, when the session was over, uh, a small group of uh, journalists we were called into a room and spoke uh, to President Zelensky. And one of the questions that was asked is, does he fear, however, this is the end of the Biden doctrine, weapons and money uh, to Ukraine? He did say that is a dangerous uh, prospect. 
He said that politics is dangerous. Uh, some of the uh, voices in the U.S. he described as being somewhat strange, but nonetheless also said that for Ukraine, there's not been an easy day ever since uh, the war started. Mm -hmm. Now, the second point uh, made by Zelensky is that the country will also need a uh, logistical uh, operation going into the winter. The concern uh, for Ukraine is not just a counteroffensive and the change in the weather, but it's also potentially seeing a repeat of what happened last year. Remember when Russia attacked uh, some of their strategic infrastructure, the country went into a blacked out for a number of days. They say they want to uh, avoid that, and for that, they will need more air defense fast so they can have it in place by December. Yeah, I have to say, Maria, there's also quite a lot. I think there was an interview yesterday with the former European Commissioner, uh, Mr. Juncker, talking about corruption in Ukraine, which we probably need to spend a bit more time on. But the focus turns also to European politics. And I don't know whether they focus a lot on AI or whether the European leaders now look at a possible Trump win and think of tariffs. Uh, yes, and Francine, I'm going to go slightly off script here because you made a very good point. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker said enlargement for Ukraine, and that is the issue that will be debated today, is not possible because the country is corrupt at every level. I actually asked uh, that question to Zelensky, and he told me that Mr. Juncker has not been to Ukraine a single day ever since the war started, and he also told me, anyway, he's an old man, I wish him health. So that was uh, the response from Zelensky. In terms of today, again, enlargement on the agenda. Yesterday, we spoke spoke with the head of the European Council. He manages this debate, and he says that by 2030, the European Union should be ready to take in new members. But that is nothing short of a revolution almost for the EU. Let's take a look. The candidate countries, the applicants, uh, they need to do their homework and they know what we are expecting from them. We are expecting reforms, rule of law, independence of justice, fight against corruption. Why? Because the, the, the purpose of the enlargement is not to be bigger. This is not the main purpose. The purpose is to be more influential, more, more powerful to protect and to uh, defend the interests of our citizens. When I say 2030, this is ambitious, I know, but it's realistic. And that was President uh, Michel talking to Bloomberg uh, yesterday. He says 2030 for the actual enlargement to happen. But when it comes to Ukraine specifically, the country says it wants to open accession talks this year before the end of the year. Maria, thanks so much. As always, I have to say that was quite a put down. Actually, saying you know he's an old man. I wish him well. well. We have to get you back on that to talk about some of the epic put downs that we've seen over the last couple of months. Maria, today over there in Granada, Spain, of course, following the EU leaders. Now here in the UK, the Labour Party has won a by-election in Scotland on a large swing from the Scottish National Party. The victory boosts Labour leader Keir Starmer's argument that his opposition party is on track to win enough seats to win the next general election against the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Well, Bloomberg's Ruth. Day David now joins us. Ruth, I love it. It's only the big political things that, that get you on air. So I'm very happy anything big happens. And what a delight to have all of your inside analysis. So how significant, first of all, is the result for Labour? Well, if you're listening to Keir Starmer, it's seismic. Um, the, but the, I think a few things to keep in mind. One, this is the first major election, Ruth Glenn, that they've had since March when a very popular leader, Nicola Sturgeon of the SNP, stepped down. And this Scotland, you know, the seats have always alternated between SNP and Labour. Absolutely, this is a big comeback for Labour, but it's one seat in a special election, and they're putting a lot of weight on it. But if you look at what the bookies were saying and what the strategists were saying, if they hadn't won it, it would have been a huge headache for Keir Starmer, especially going into their annual conference over the weekend. So I think we have to put it into the context of what's happening in the broader scenario. Labour is kind of clawing back some of the gains in Scotland where they're opposition to holding another referendum and going back to the European Union had undercut their wins. But the S&P is facing its own struggles, right? Yeah. And so and this is you're right. If they hadn't gotten it, that that would have been a huge story and it would have you know, put a lot of question marks surrounding labor. So what are we expecting from the party conference that starts on Sunday? He's going to start it on a high note, absolutely, and lay out his strategy for winning the elections next year. Labor is still polling 20 points ahead of the conservatives in the poll. So they have that 
kind of lead for them. But, you know, the UK's election of first past the polls, the way that they gain victory in Parliament means that just because they're polling this much higher is not a certainty and they still have a long way to go. I mean, some of the economic headwinds that are facing Rishi Sunak and when we're talking about just how much room do you have to give away fiscal like tax benefits or to cut taxes or to do any of these things, the economy and the state of it is going to stay the same. So voters will be thinking very carefully if we get Labour into power, what changes for us? And unless they can come up with a coherent plan of what really changes to make voters' lives better, I think that discontent is something that might colour both parties. Ruth, thank you so much, as always, for your insight, Ruth David. There, our London bureau chief, looking at the politics of the UK. Now, the US and China are said to be moving closer to setting up a meeting between President Joe Biden and Xi Jinping at next month's APEC summit in California. Now, sources say both countries have been scouting meeting sites in San Francisco. Well, Biden and Xi have not spoken since the G20 in Bali last year. Neither side has confirmed the meeting. Now, coming up, it's been a turbulent time for Sweden's biggest pension fund after losing its chairwoman and billions of dollars. So we look at the future for Alekta. That's next and this is Bloomberg. Well, switching gears to European rates in the property sector, Sweden's biggest pension fund, Elekta, which manages 1.2 trillion kroner pension funds for a quarter of the Swedish population, is once again under the spotlight. Now, for more, let's get straight to Bloomberg's Love Lehman in Stockholm. Love, so what's causing the worries there and how's the reaction been so far? Yeah, as you said, uh, it's uh, Sweden's biggest pension fund elected with around uh, $100 billion in assets under management. Uh, that is once again in the crosshairs after the debacle that we had earlier this spring with the, with the U.S. niche banks, uh, where it lost uh, $2 billion. Uh, this time it has, it has made a nearly $5 billion bet on a single real estate company called Heimstad & Bostad. And um, now there is a risk that that bet might, uh, might go sour if it doesn't invest even more capital in it. And um, you have uh, the wider media really scrutinizing this uh, investment, uh, you know, the public as well. And, and, and they are questioning the grounds on which it uh, was originally made. So, uh, Lovi, what's at stake here, actually? Are there any really contagion risks? Uh, could you repeat that, please? What's at stake? Could we see contagion? Could it spread to other parts? Uh, yes, well, it is uh, one of the biggest bond issuers in, in, uh, among the European property companies. It has got around uh, $10 billion worth of bonds issued. And uh, uh, some say there is a risk that um, if things go really bad for, for Heimstad and Bostad, it could lose, uh, could lose its investment grade rating. And in that case, uh, you might see more, more uh, widespread contagion. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. Thank you so much, Lovie Lehman there in Stockholm. Now, Aviva, one of the biggest risers in Europe following the so-called uncooked mention in the Betteville report regarding potential takeover interests from the insurance company. Now, Bloomberg has reached out to Aviva representatives for comment. You can see Aviva gaining 9%. Now, Philips also suffered another setback as the U.S. drug regulator requested additional tests on its sleep apnea devices, warning that the company's analysis of the recalled products is inadequate. Up next, we have plenty more on the markets with our Bloomberg Brief. Danny Berger in London, Manus Cranny in New York. The big story today is, of course, what's going on in the U.S. The U.S., left, right and center with the jobs report, hopefully giving us a little bit of clues of what the Fed does or doesn't do next. This is Bloomberg. Happy Friday, everyone.